Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Follow the links in the description below. Welcome to Furious Driving and today I'm at the wheel of a ridiculously rare rover. Yes, we've gone back to 1947 for this, the P2 12 horsepower Tourer. As I say, this is a rare car. The only made about 200 of them between 1946 and 1947. And most of those went abroad. In fact, they were all supposed to go abroad. None were really meant to stay here. However, a few somehow did because Rover weren't really very good at this old export business. In the 1930s, they dallied with it and the, uh, the greatest extent of anything they'd done was to put uh, bigger wheels and tires on a couple of cars. The P2 had, was in fact the first car they made in left-hand drive for exports. However, when they built this thing, the Tourer, the open top car, they only made it in right-hand drive. The majority, I believe, went to Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, those kind of places. It's a fascinating story. Let's pull over and take a little look around this thing. It's a pretty car. So yes, this is the astonishingly rare Rover P2 12HP Tourer. Now there were quite a few P2 uh, saloons and sports saloons around, but the Tourer is ridiculously rare. Only made for under two years, and they only built around 200 of them. This is from that curious period in the mid-1940s when peace broke out and the manufacturers were left a bit floundering. Because they'd ended the 1930s with lots of new and exciting, interesting designs, but it was now six years later, the Americans had moved way ahead in terms of design and engineering, and they were left a little bit floundering and had to play catch up in a hurry. And that meant putting revamped versions of pre-war designs back into production. So the P2 is the first of those cars. Curiously, it's called the P2. It's the first of the Rovers to bear the P moniker. The P3 followed it, the P4, the anti-rover, the P5B, which is the, the big armchair on wheels, and of course the P6, the last of the P cars, which is of course what I've been putting the 4.6 litre V8 into at home. This though was the first, the P2. Curiously though, you're thinking, why is it called a P2? when it was the first. The answer is the M-Type, which is a small light car because manufacturers knew that in the uh, austere post-war years, small cars were definitely what was required. Small cars with small engines that were cheap to run and tax. However, the M design never made it into production. That would have been the P1. So the P2 hails from the days of export or die when manufacturers had to be putting a vast amount of resources into getting money back into the country. In 1946, the government mandate was 50% of all cars produced had to be exported. In 1947, 75%. And that was no tall order considering we were dealing with decade old expensive designs in a time of great austerity. Now, under the car, the P2 chassis actually dates back to 1934. Well, 1933, technically, because that's when the uh, model range it came from was revealed. It was designed by Morris Wilkes. It's kind of a ladder chassis with channel sections and box sections, but it had a habit of being not very torsionally rigid, and it would shimmy over bumps. So it has a Wilmot Breeden harmonic balancer hidden carefully under the front bumper, which is basically a leaf spring with big bob weights on the end, cunningly concealed with nice bits of chrome. So that is already quite an old bit of technology sitting underneath the car. It has a live rear axle, beam front axles, and semi-elliptical leaf springs with hydraulic dampers underneath there to cushion the ride. And under the bonnet, being a 12 HP, it's got a four cylinder engine. We'll talk more about that in a second. So let's take a look around the inside of the P2 Tourer. Now, you'll notice of course, it is suicide doors, so rear hinged, very long doors as well, with this curious little step down and then step up so you can hang your arm over the side when you're driving. We do have a little hole just here so that we can uh, insert our wet weather gear if it was nasty. Looking around the inside of the car, we've got plush leather seats, very nice indeed. Nice buckety seats. Rover cars always had a hint of daring elegance and sportiness. So uh, hence we have slightly buckety seats which do tip forward from the middle so that you can climb into the back. Lovely green carpet to go with the green exterior and green leather. Very, very nice indeed. And of course we even have a little ashtray in the back because the 30s, well, 40s by this point. Step aside inside, it's always a little bit tight getting your feet around the edges of the door frame of a 30s and 40s car. And we've got a lovely dashboard. This is as real as it gets wooden dashboard now. So in the center, we've got 
all our instruments clustered together. So we've got a speedometer here, which pegs 80 miles an hour, and apparently a former owner of this car has taken it to 80 miles an hour, which I can only imagine being described as hairy, to say the least. We've got a nice big clock over here on the left, an amp meter, petrol and oil. Push the switch to switch to oil. And another little gauge on the right-hand side for oil pressure and water temperature in Fahrenheit, because you know, in the middle of the century. There is a choke down here, don't need that because the engine's warm. Turn the ignition on, push the button, and the thing just purrs into life. Underneath that we have our light switch, offside head, panel light switch for dimming, and petrol reserve switch as well. Now this is a curious one you might be wondering about. Fixed and free, it says in this big dial here. This is your free wheel control. And this is a thing that Rover had on cars up until the 1960s, I think, which really does make things a little bit weird because you don't get any engine braking, but you can change the only partly synchro meshed gearbox with full, well, the equivalent of full synchro mesh. It's quite an unusual thing. And above all of this, we do have these big knurled knobs here, which are windscreen wiper controls. So 1947 windscreen wipers, lap of luxury. On the right hand side, we do have our trafficators because this doesn't have indicators from you, it had trafficators. And finally, we have a little switch on the steering wheel to dipping the headlights. And of course, we've got the horn, horn test. Oh, wow. That's a post-war export or die pop. It's coming through on the Intercontinental Express to foreign lands for big money coming back into Britain or something. Now, there's no tea shelf up here. There's a metal bit of bodywork protruding with some green leather on it, which is lovely, and then very, very real wood. Underneath that, we have got a tray, which contains a molded rubber, which is very advanced at the time, toolkit. So you, if you need to do any odd jobs on the road, you can pull that out and find your spanners, your box spanner, whatever else you need to keep the car back on the road. We have a little storage cubby down there, a little glove box, likewise on the driver's side. And underneath we do have, oh, it won't come out now, oh, a little tray, which I don't know if this is original or not. It doesn't look original to me. However, in 1947, the year this car was made, the dashboard was altered slightly to allow for an optional extra radio to be fitted. Obviously that's not fitted to this car. Also you'll notice there's no heater either, that too was an optional extra. Looking at the rest of the interior, we've got the green carpet which is quite luxurious for a 40s car, which goes a little way up the doors to protect the car doors from kicking, but it's leather slash vinyl door covering. No wind up windows because it is a fully open car, but we do have a door handle. Looking into the back of the car, we have nothing apart from an armrest in the back for rear seat comfort. Stepping back out of the car, there's a few visual changes between the pre-war and the post-war tourers. The big ones really are the shape of the front wings, which are a bit different. These come down longer, a bit rounder, but square at the back. And at the back of the car, the pre-war cars had a moulded shape of the spare wheel in them. This though, it was felt looks too old fashioned, so they got rid of that. And now the spare wheel is still in the same place, but it's now fully enclosed invisibly in the back of the boot lid. It's not a huge amount of space to be fair because the, uh, the uh, roof does actually fold into this area just here. I won't try and pull it out because it's complicated and will break. Right, let's get this thing back on the road and see what it's like actually, well, to drive. Uh, two things to quickly mention, the gear change in this car is phenomenal. It is like a rifle bolt and it's fabulous. And of course, the push button in the center is just like finding reverse on a three and a half litre automatic. Secondly, secondly, the handbrake. It has got the shortest throw-off handbrake of anything I've ever used. It's less than one click. Ridiculous. Let's pull away and talk about the driving experience. The clutch is quite soft, but very short travel. Not too heavy, fortunately. Gear change though, it is an absolute delight. And although these cars are ridiculously rare, I've actually driven one before. Trafficating to the right. A few years ago, I got to drive one at Percival Motors. I never thought I would get to drive another one. So that's quite exciting. 
the steering is ridiculously light. I mean, insanely light. It's a little bit of a job to keep it in a straight line on a bumpy little road like this. I'm only doing like 40 miles an hour or so. If you look over my shoulder, you can see the steering inputs. It's like a Cary Grant movie. Now I'm driving in freewheel mode, which makes it easier to change gear. It has synchro on third and fourth. It's a four speed manual. But when you've got the uh, freewheel out, it means you can change gear more easily. And if you let go, it basically disconnects the engine and it's idles to save fuel. It does mean it gives you effectively synchro mesh in first and second as well. But the brakes do become a little bit weaker than they would be otherwise. And it's making it a very easy thing to drive, has to be said. The P2 range had Girling Mechanical, that's rod brakes, so not the most powerful but good for the time, and Berman Douglas Worm and Nut Steering. It's wandery, but you quickly get used to it. Now being a, well, very expensive car, it did have a few technical innovations to try and lure in some customers. It had a thing called a Lovax Bijour chassis lubrication system. Because in these days you had to go around and lubricate various points on your chassis to stop it seizing up. And this was a rod somewhere down under the car where you pump it and it lubes all 23 points with grease. The only thing is it was apparently a bit prone to clogging up and took more maintenance to maintain the lubing system than actually just maintaining the chassis would have done. Wipers. All the Tourers were built around the 12 HP engine. There are rumours though that there were a couple of 10 HPs but no records or survivors bear that out. There were four engines in the P2 range, 10, 12, the 14 and the 16. The first two were four cylinder and the latter two six cylinder, all had a hundred millimetre stroke. The P10 was a 1398cc with an RAC rating of 10.9 HP and the 12 1496cc with an RAC rating of 11.9 HP. That's about 53 horsepower. And they both had three bearing crankshafts and a single SU carb. The 6.14 and 16 used Solex downdrafts and the big 2.116, which was not sold as a Tourer, made 66 horsepower. Amazingly, there don't appear to be any road tests that give accurate data for acceleration, top speed and so forth for these things. Having run for such a short amount of time, the best data really is the pre-war 30s versions of the cars. Pre-war, the 14 saloon was tested as having a top speed of 72 miles an hour and a 0 to 50 of 22 seconds and 0 to 60 of 41 seconds. But bear in mind, 30s road tests were nowhere near as precise as we're used to these days. Pre-war, all Rovers had actually been built in Coventry, even though they're known as a Birmingham Solihull company. It wasn't until 1939 when uh, the Solihull plant was built as a shadow factory for the Air Ministry. And then unfortunately in 1940, the Coventry factory was actually bombed by the Luftwaffe and destroyed. So post-war, production moved to Solihull, the brand new enormous factory. Now pre-war, and in fact up to the P2, Rover built all of their own bodies. It wasn't until the P3 that they started farming stuff out to pressed steel. In-house body construction was taken care of by AP Panelcraft, who rented part of Rover's Clay Lane factory. And the P2 was built steel over an ash frame. This, though, is aluminium. And there's a reason for that. Rover had been making aircraft wings, and they seem to have an awful lot of aluminium lying around the place. The Land Rover is made out of aluminium as well. because there seemed to be a preponderance of damaged stock that they were able to buy very cheap off the air ministry. So big panels going into Rover P2s, little panels going into all the rivety bits of a Land Rover. All seemed to work out quite well. 
across the entire P2, well, that's the entire Rover range, just 5,115 cars were built in 1946 and 8,220 in 1947, compared to 11,000 in 1939. And of those, just 200 of those were tourists. It's thought maybe 100 survive worldwide. Driving this car feels like you're in something very special. The craftsmanship of the interior, the rifle bolt precision of the gear change, the smooth running engine, and the gentle ride soaking up every bump really do make this one of Britain's fine cars, as the adverse said. This has the elegance and refinement that Rover was synonymous with up until the dark BL days, and I love it. I'm off to go and find a copy of the automobile and search the classifieds, because I want more of this every day. Well, thanks for joining me in this absolutely beautiful 1947 Rover. It's a real, real rarity and an absolute treat to be out in, well, unfortunately not the best weather, sadly, it's turned out. But if you've enjoyed this, please hit like and subscribe and join us again next time driving something completely different.